Okay, so what we're going to talk about now is intrusion detection and prevention systems. So essentially ways that you can um, automatically detect attacks that are happening on a network. So essentially you have software that will monitor um, traffic on a network or on a computer and um, try and identify whether it looks like something malicious is taking place. So uh, you guys may have seen this clip before. Um, so if you have, then um, bear with me. But I think it's worth... Uh, this is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? So the point is, uh, look out for cyclists. No, <laughs> um, the point is, if it's quite easy to miss things if you don't know what you're looking for. So the same thing applies for log files, and when you're um, monitoring a network and all the network traffic that's happening, it can be quite hard to see um, what you need to see from the noise of just everything that's happening on a network. So because it's quite complicated, it helps if there's ways that you can automate that process. So ways that you can that can help you to detect the uh, any problems. So some terminology um, to do with whether or not you're successfully detecting something that's happened is a true positive. Does anyone can anyone tell me what a true positive is? Yeah, so you think you're being attacked and you are being attacked, so you, you have correctly identified that something's happening. A false positive? Then it shows the result that you expected that the actual thing that was happening wasn't actually happening. Yes, so you, um, it, you've detected something, and you, but that thing didn't actually happen. So you think it tells you something's happened but didn't really happen. A true negative? You think something's happening but it's normal. Uh, no, not quite. Everything, uh, you, some, you think everything's normal, but something's happening. Sorry, what did you say? You think uh, No, you said the opposite. Well, hell no. <laughs> he said he said something wasn't happening, but uh, it was something wasn't happening. But every, but you thought something was happening. I said something. Uh, I thought something something is happening, but you think everything's normal. It's neither of those. Okay. I didn't say any of them. Okay. And what, okay. So, anyone else want to go? Yeah. So you don't think anything's happening, and nothing is happening. So it truly is nothing. True negative. Um, false negative. That's what I said. Well, you don't think anything's happening, but something is happening. No. But you, <laughs> <laughs> um, a false. Uh, negative is when the software doesn't detect anything. Um, no, what? <laughs> it's, basically a, it's basically a double negative, so it can cancel yeah. each other out, which means something is happening. The software is saying nothing's happening, but, something but is there happening. is something happening. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, which are the worst in terms of if you're trying to detect something? What's the worst thing? False negative. False negative. Yeah. Or false positive. Yeah, if the software is basically lying to you, if it's getting it wrong, then that's bad. It's better if it flags up something <coughs> that's that um, a, a false positive is not too bad. If it flags up something and you invest, you can investigate it and figure out, oh no, that that didn't really happen. False negative if it just um, misses stuff is particularly bad. And so. Treasure detection system um, will basically it'll 
monitor activity and it produces reports and alerts. Um, a network-based IDS is basically what people think of an IDS. It's something that it listens to network traffic. Uh, and it can be monitoring multiple computers. So depending on where on the network it is, it might be listening to all of the traffic on an entire um, you know, organization's network, for example. And then if it sees any suspicious activity, it can flag that up. Or it might be on a smaller part of the network and just be listening between two computers, for example. Um, Host-based IDS uh, will actually monitor system activity. So it'll, things like system calls and logs and look at files. Um, and that is kind of, uh, a lot of people don't think of host-based IDS when you're talking about IDS, but it, it is another kind of a, um, intrusion detection system. And that will typically run on um, you know, an individual computer. Um, and there, there's a lot of overlap between that and other kinds of security features, like um, you know, a lot of antivirus software will do some kind of heuristics and things like that. So an intrusion prevention system, as opposed to detection system, is a basically the same thing except that it proactively does something. So um, rather than just flag up the fact that something's happening, you might write a rule that says if you detect this thing, then do this. So you disconnect them from the network or disconnect this network connection or change the firewall rules. Um, so so it, it can actually do something about it. Uh, also known as an intrusion detection and prevention system because obviously it needs to detect it before it can prevent it. Um, and it does mean that you need to design your network a bit differently and it requires a, more resources because it needs to be real time um, so that it can filter the network traffic as opposed to an IDS which doesn't matter if it's got a bit of lag. Um, it doesn't require, as, you know, you don't need to necessarily have as many resources. So if you're designing the network for um, your organization, if you have an IPS, it needs to be inline. So between the you know the two sets of tra traffic, so the two computers, so that it can actually do something about it, uh, so that it can set some firewall rules or set send a reset packet to um, kill the TCP connection. Um, whereas an IDS can basically be anywhere on the network, um, <coughs> as long as it has network traffic forwarded to it that it needs in order to um, figure out whether there's an attack. So for example, if you have a small organization, you might have um, the internet and you've, you've got some corporate level firewall between you, you know, all of your computers um, and the internet. And then you might have an IPS system, so it does some intrusion prevention and that's in line between you know, where the internet and the intranet, so all your actual computers in your organization, because then it can actually do something about it and basically stop any traffic. Um, whereas an IDS can be, um, doesn't have to be inline, it just needs all the traffic forwarded to it for it to look at. And for a larger organization, you might actually choose to place IDS and IPS systems at multiple points throughout the organization. So when you design your um, network, you might decide that there are different network segments that actually you could put um, you know intrusion detection where in between like the outside world and your internal network but then if you <coughs> really are quite paranoid you might decide well actually I want to monitor everything happens on my internal network as well just in case you know one of my own employees starts attacking my service for example which might not get detected um, depending on where you place these things on your network so the way that a lot of these systems work is based on signature-based detection. So basically, just like with antivirus, where there's different ways of detecting whether a piece of software is, is um, malware, uh, we have different ways we can detect that network traffic is suspicious and something we might want to flag up. So signature-based is basically where we've got a database of all these different signatures um, of known attacks or known activity that we know is um, a, you know, some kind of malicious action. So it might be based on a string. So we might see um, a particular string that only ever happens on the network when some exploit is, is being used or when cer some certain service is being used in a way that you don't expect it to be used. And, um, or based on pattern matching, so a little bit more complicated where you use regular expressions um, to actually look for particular kinds of information on the network. Um, and you, know, you can write rules 
that will use these to actually say, okay, this is this kind of attack. Um, so for example, if we wanted to write a um, snort rule to detect um, a particular type of buffer overflow attack, then you look at the source code of the exploit and say, okay, so this exploit sends this um, kind of thing in order to cause that buffer, buffer overflow. So for example, it sends um, you know, a login attempt and then a really, really long string and then some um, like log out attempt or something, and then we can actually look at all the traffic that's coming into that computer to see whether that's what's happening. And if it is, then we know that it's an attack, and we can flag it. But just like with um, signature-based anti-malware, you're not going to detect a novel attack. So if someone comes up with a brand new thing, signature-based detection is probably going to miss it, because there won't be a rule written to detect it. Anomaly-based detection is basically looking for something that's out of the ordinary. So you might just look for the amount of traffic. So you might have a particular server that normally only gets certain kinds of requests, and then suddenly one day it's getting loads and loads of requests, it's getting lots of stuff sent back and forth from it, and you might say, oh, that looks quite suspicious, that's worth investigating to figure out why. Um, but you might also look at, pro so that's statistical anom anomaly. Um, you might also look at protocol anomaly. So you know that this um, server is supposed to be using HTTP traffic on port 80, and suddenly you see some other stuff going on in port 80 that doesn't look like HTTP traffic at all. And maybe they're just using that port because it's open on your firewalls to, to communicate. So um, And then that could flag something up, and then you could investigate it. Um, and there are various ways that um, attacks can avoid being detected by IDS systems because you know, if you're um, writing your rules looking for plain strings, then they might, um, if you didn't write your rule very well, for example, so you were being too specific when you wrote the rule, you you might write your rule to detect when you use Metasploit to exploit it, because Metasploit sends this particular, particular string. But then if someone else has written a different exploit, it might work in a slightly different way, but still take advantage of the same programming flaw. Um, and your signature wouldn't detect that different attack if you you know if you haven't written it very well. Um, and anomaly-based systems uh, are generally weak because what if the behavior changes over time, um, and suddenly you just have a busy day, and suddenly alerts start getting sent, or you start using the software differently, and some alerts start getting to you know. The IDS says, well, this is different, this is different, but actually you're just using the system in a normal way, but, but differently. But also, they might be able to evade, evade detection by trying to look like something that you would normally do, but subtly different. Um, and obviously, with signature-based um, rules, you need to keep those rules up to date all the time because you know new attacks are discovered. Um, so you know you need to actually keep updating those rules to detect everything, which is quite a difficult problem, which is the same problem that, uh, you know, obviously there are quite a lot of similarities between this and ways of detecting anti-malware. -mal um, so um, often there's actually quite a lot of network traffic as well, so you need a fair amount of power, like computing power, to actually analyze everything and to do it well. And encryption Often, as soon as something's encrypted, you can't actually see what the network traffic is. Um, so if it's end-to-end -end encryption, then an IPS or an IDS is not going to be able to detect, detect anything unless it's at one of the endpoints. Uh, and you can use different encoding to send the same message and all that sort of stuff. So there's just so many ways that it can fail, basically. Um, packet fragmentation is another one. So if you, um, if you don't remember, or you haven't learned about pack packet fragmentation. Basically, it allows networks um, that you have different packet sizes, different amounts of information that it sends over the network at a time, um, so they can communicate. So you, you can basically break larger packets down into small ones, uh, which get sent individually, and then in the destination, they get assembled back into the original packet. Um, but it can be used to avoid IDS sometimes because you can actually break the traffic down into such small pieces that an IDS, if it's looking at individual pieces of network traffic, can't see that it's an attack because they just see a little piece of it. Um, and modern IDS systems often try, you know, try to avoid this problem by actually reassembling packets themselves 
but obviously it means it's doing um, extra work, so it's extra processing power to actually try and keep track of all this stuff on the network. And for example, this piece of software which is Frag Route, um, which is an evasion tool uh, that you can use to try and trick um, IDSs. And actually, also if you use Metasploit, um, the Metasploit framework includes various evasion techniques and encoding techniques that you can use to evade um, poorly written um, IDS rules as well. Also, we can't tell if an attack was successful, only that it was attempted. So we just see the network traffic. And a lot of the times, that won't tell you everything you need to know. So you just you see that something got sent across, but did that machine actually, did it work? You know, you, you might actually need to go and investigate and find out whether or not the attack was successful. Um, and it's only going to detect something on the part of the network that it's exposed to. And there's a lot of complexity. So there's lots and lots of rules. If it's analyzing every single pack, packet, uh, it needs to reassemble all the, pa all the packets, um, consider it in context. Um, you know, the, there's just quite a lot of resources required, um, and it can lead to false positives and negatives, just because it's quite a complicated problem. So an example of a, um, an IDS system, which can also be used as an IPS, is Snort. It's very popular, um, supposedly the most deployed IDS system um, in the world, um, you know, according to them. Um, uh, and it's got fairly straightforward uh, signature-based rule language, and there's lots of different front ends available, and um, a lot of other IDS tools share the same tools, um, the same rule set. So if you write a, a snort rule, you can actually import that into most IDS systems. Also, because there's a lot of freely available rules written for snort, um, it means that you know the the other commercial systems will actually you know use some of those rules. And there are commercial systems actually based on snort. So the way snort works is essentially there's um, it starts by cap capturing packets off the network. It does some pre-processing, so that involves um, stream reassembly, packet defragmentation, protocol decoding, normalization, and doing any non-rule detection, so things like port scans and things like that, so it's not the standard rules. And after it's done all that to actually collect all the information together, it runs it through the detect detection engine, which is basically it runs through all the rules that people have written for it uh, to try and um, find any matches which might generate an alert or um, log something, and then if that's the case, it gets passed through to alerts and logging. So depending on how complicated the rules are, they get prioritized. So the simplest rules run first. So if your rule only involves like IC, um, IP headers or TCP headers, then that happens first. Um, and if, for example, you're actually matching the content of the traffic, then that's going to happen um, last because that's like more intensive, more work for the IDS to do. And some examples of what a snort rule looks like um, is it starts with the action that happens and then the protocol that's being monitored, the source IP address, the source port, so the, the, that's the computer that's coming from, and then the destination, um, uh, so the direction that the connection is happening, and then the destination IP address and the destination port. Um, and then in, and then you've got brackets and then the um, other details. So for example, what the error message is going to be that ends up in a log file. Uh, or you can also include extra rules that it needs to match. So you know, for example, the fact it has to include certain strings and um, other things like that. So that second line there here, you can see an example where we've got an alert that generates on uh, TCP traffic. Uh, from anyone, basically, any any IP address on any source port uh, that's connecting in to any computer on port 80. Um, so message port 80 connection, um, and as we all know, port 80 is yeah. So essentially, as soon as there's any HTTP connection, that alert will will ring. So probably not alert that you want on your network, unless you knew for sure you didn't have a a, um, a web server or something, I guess. Uh, but then you could also include um, like content rules. So this, where it says, you know, if the content includes the string top secret, then um, 
then you know we'll pop up things saying you know we'll we'll create an alert that says looking at top secret stuff or something you know just as some really basic examples. So if all of the conditions are true, then the rule is matched and the action takes place. So the actions can include like sending an alert um, or you know writing to a log file, and you have protocols like TCP, UDP, ICMP. Um, you know, directions is either going in one direction or either direction, um, and pattern matching, which is a little bit slower. You can have content, um, or you can use Perl compatible regular expressions, which uh, we'll talk about soon. So um, the sorts of things you can do when you're logging, you can log to syslog, again something that we'll talk about in a minute, uh, an XML file, you could log to a database, or to log files. Um, if you do a little bit of configuration, you could basically send it anywhere. So you can set it up so it sends you an IM, like an instant message, for example, or an email or an SMS. And um, the, you can use the Snort program itself as like a, um, a network sniffer. Um, so you can actually just use it um, to, to listen in on, on all network traffic. Um, but usually you start it up as a daemon program, so it's running in the background um, as an IDS. You can set it up to, to log, uh, and you can tell it where to, to log its files. Um, if you set it up as an IDS, you can basically set up the config file, includes all sorts of information, um, and will typically you'll you'll uh, log alerts, um, and the, there's a number of ways that you can configure it based on your own um, requirements. Uh, if you've previously captured network traffic, you can actually run that through Snort, um, so it doesn't have to be real time. You can actually record all the traffic first, just like by using TCP dump or um, using Wireshark. Um, and then you can basically feed that into the Snort program and it will go through and generate alerts and things. So if you want to update the rules for Snort, there's some free rule sets you can get. There's also um, like a commercial thing where you can either get a free access to, to rules that are a month old, or you can pay for the most recent up-to-date version of the rules. Uh, and there's a number of um, uh, tools that you can use. Uh, so you can do things like um, log, <coughs> log in a faster way uh, for later um, processing. Um, and you can also um, use scripts like pulled pork to, um, to actually keep Snort up to date. And there's lots of different ways you can um, actually manage it. So uh, in the labs, you'll actually um, use Snort to write some rules and do it basically just do it at the command prompt. Um, but there are graphical tools you can use to manage it. So you can either use a you know typical like um, graphical application or there's web apps and all sorts of tools you can use that um, can help you to set it up. Um, so there are some examples on the slide there. So it's actually up to the person that's reviewing the logs to actually make sense of all this information. So, you know, obviously, you, you, if, you, if it's telling you that something's happened on your network, you need to actually go and investigate to find out um, whether it really has happened. Because, you know, let's face it, an IDS is not always that reliable. It, it gives you, it's basically, it gives you a heads up that something's going on. And from that point, you could go and actually check whether it's true. Yeah. Is there, you know, you said you could uh, trigger alerts to via SMS. Mm. Um, is there a possibility to do real time updates? So, for example, if it's just mm -hmm. an idea to um, detect something, could you then um, text back your screen and it would take action, like uh, you know, to message back to the system to? So right. a yeah, so you're saying have an IPS system that rather than automatically taking action, you have a person involved via SMS or something and they can decide whether or not to follow through and actually change the rules. So rather than it's safe, it's just a, a standard person coming in on yeah. the, and it's alert and they get kicked straight back out. Yeah. Uh, say the computer's still on and they pop out from there and get yeah. and you could just tell it to do whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, that I mean, yeah, that sounds um, 
that if that was something that you wanted to do, that sounds like you know you could definitely achieve that. Whether or not the commercial products will provide that feature out of the box, I'm not sure. I was but yeah. It's not something that Snort does out of the box, but it's something that you could make it do. Um, and I'm not sure about like whether Cisco's um, IFES systems have that specific feature, but it sounds it sounds reasonable, uh, especially if you want to actually look into it before taking action. I mean, with with uh, Snort, if you set it up as an IFES, you can set. <laughs> Um, specific rules to be IPS and others to be IDS. So you can say this rule, if you detect this, then do something about it, basically like drop, drop this connection and stuff like that. Um, but as far as I'm aware, I might be wrong, as far as I'm aware, there's not the feature to actually wait for a response from a sysadmin or something. But yeah, it, sound, it, but it, it sounds like a good, maybe it's a good finding your project. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and then you need to start off the incident response process. So, if you're in a larger organization, if you once you've verified that something really has happened, then it might you know you need to follow your incident response plan to actually do something to resolve the issue. So, some other IDS systems. There's Bro, which is also free and open source software, um, and it does um, it actually can import uh, Snort rules into its own format. Uh, and it has some extra protocol analysis and um, features that Snort doesn't have. Uh, there's also um, Suricata. <laughs> How would you pronounce that? Suricata. Yeah, thanks. Uh, which is essentially, it's a research project and um, supposedly a lot faster than Snort. And it does, um, I believe it's that's more like parallel processing and stuff. So it's designed to be a replacement for Snort. But it uses all the same rule set as well. Um, I think from memory it's developed by a university. So, um, but there are obviously lots of um, commercial vendors as well that provide various uh, IDS and IPS systems. So Sourcefire is actually um, the commercial Snort offering. Um, so that company provides uh, Snort based solutions. Cisco have their own um, Juniper. IBM, McAfee, Tipping Point, uh, all provide different IPS and IDS systems. So um, if you're interested, there's some more resources there that you might want to look up. Uh, and um, that's that sort of got to talk about, that's what I have to say about IDS systems.